Guten Tag, I'm Josiah Schmidt. It's Monday, November 3rd of 2014, and you're listening to episode number 5 of the German-American Genealogist Podcast. Have you struggled with pinpointing the pesky birthplace of your German immigrant ancestor? You'd like to research your ancestor further back in Germany and find their parents and grandparents and so on going back to the 1600s or maybe even back to Charlemagne. But before you can do that, you need to know what town your immigrant ancestor was from. A person can spend years ripping their hair out trying to sleuth the origin of their ancestor and come up empty-handed. Well, save your hairline because we've got a whole episode ahead devoted to this very subject. When you first start to research a German-American immigrant ancestor, they can seem more isolated and mysterious than a weasel in Antarctica. Who in the heck was this person? Where did they come from? Where was their family? One strong tendency I have noticed in researching German-American genealogy is that the first household German immigrants lived in after arriving in America was usually the household of relatives or friends from their hometown in the old country. Rarely did Germans immigrate to America and then just take up residence with a complete stranger. Germans typically planned their immigration process quite carefully. Okay, I'll just bring along the bare essentials. Let's see. Uh, Ten pounds of Wiener Schnitzel, uh, fifteen pounds of Blutwurst, uh, twelve pounds of Bockwurst, yeah, uh, seventeen pounds of Knackwurst, uh, fourteen pounds of Leberwurst, mm, twenty pounds of Bratwurst, oh, and one Leberkäse sandwich for the road. In Germany, would-be emigrants would usually seek permission from their village council, or later on the imperial government, to emigrate, then spend several months securing money from their own savings and from supportive relatives to pay for their trip. All the while, they would be corresponding with German relatives and friends already residing in America to arrange for a job and a place to stay once they arrived in America. When I was researching my great-great-great-granduncle, Wilhelm, a.k.a. William Schmidt, who was a German immigrant, I first found him living in Tama County, Iowa, in the 1885 Iowa State Census, in the household of an Adam and Mary L. Hotzel. Since I didn't recognize the Hotzel surname at this early point in my research, I figured it must have just been a fellow German farmer who was kind enough to give my Uncle Will a job and a place to stay. But when I started to see the Hatzel name crop up alongside other Schmitz, I did a little more research into Adam and Marielle Hatzel. Mary's obituary, in a February 1902 edition of the Trayer Star Clipper newspaper, revealed that her maiden name was Lindemann which just so happened to be the same maiden name as William Schmidt's mother, Martha Lindemann Schmidt. Further investigation revealed that Mary L. Hatzel was a sister of William's mother, Martha Lindemann Schmidt. The middle initial of L in Mary Hatzel's name was not short for her middle name, which was Elizabeth. It was an abbreviation for her maiden name, Lindemann. After I put these puzzle pieces together, I realized that William Schmidt's first residence in America was not with some strangers who just happened to be fellow Americans. William was first living with his uncle and aunt in America. You can often reveal a whole new branch of your family tree by thoroughly checking into the identities of the household with whom your German immigrant ancestor first lives after arriving in America. If you're not sure what town in Germany your immigrant ancestor came from, see if you can find out the hometown of the heads of the first American household 
your immigrant ancestor lived in. Chances are good that your immigrant ancestor came from the same town as the people who gave him or her a place to stay when he first came to America. Conversely, if you found records in Germany that state that a relative of yours emigrated to America, but you can't find out where in America they ended up, check the households of other relatives and people who are known to have come from that German hometown in American censuses immediately after your German relative would have immigrated. You may find your German emigrant relative living in this household with a slightly misspelled or mistranscribed name. Always pay close attention to the people with whom your German immigrant ancestor would have first lived when they got to America. Usually, these immigrants wouldn't have been able to afford a home of their own until after several years of working, unless they struck it rich. Eureka! <laughs> so in the meantime, while they saved up money, these immigrants usually started off living with someone they knew, most likely someone from their original town in Germany. Germans almost always chain-migrated to America. If you have a German immigrant ancestor, bet on the fact that several of their close family members also immigrated to America, probably both before and after your ancestor. Readjusting to a new country, a new language, and a new way of life would have been difficult. Welcome to McDonald's. Would you like to try our Big Mac? I was actually more interested in ordering perhaps a handkesa with some spargel and perhaps a little gespritzo to wash it down. Uh, we don't have those things. Do you just want a cheeseburger? Oh, I see. Well, I suppose that will have to do. You want fries with that? What is this fries you speak of? It's, uh... Potatoes in fried form. Oh, yeah. Well, why didn't you just say so? Uh, give me these fried potatoes uh, with a little bit of hard-boiled egg green sauce, danke. Many Germans wouldn't have undertaken such a radical change in lifestyle if they didn't have some piece of home waiting for them in America. Immigration was also a costly process and relatives who had already gone to America and become successful could send some of their savings to family members back in Germany to help them with the emigration process. To find who the other immigrant family members of your German ancestor were, try checking the area, usually the counties, where your immigrant ancestor lived in America for other people with the same surname as your ancestor. Investigate those same surnamed people in close proximity to your ancestor and see if you can establish a relationship. For someone with a common last name like Schmidt or Meyer, it might be difficult to wade through all of the unrelated families with the same name in a wide area. But for a very rare surname like Kurtzel or Neeweiner, you might be able to thoroughly investigate all of the families with that surname in the entire state or the entire country. And after you've determined your ancestor's birthplace in Germany, try contacting the state archive in Germany in the province where your ancestor was from and ask if the archive can tell you the names of some of the other individuals with your ancestor's surname from your ancestor's hometown who are also recorded as having emigrated from Germany. If your ancestor was from a town in the province of Hessen, then you would contact the Hessian State Archives in Marburg. Or if your ancestor was from a town in the province of Bayern, a.k.a. Bavaria, then you would contact the Bavarian State Archives in Munich. You can find the appropriate archive pretty easily through a Google search. Once the State Archive tells you the names of people with your ancestor's surname from your ancestor's birth town, who also emigrated from Germany, 
then you can try to find where in America, or Canada, Australia, Argentina, etc., those individuals ended up. These other immigrants probably produced whole long-lost branches of your cousins. If you can find one of the ship passenger lists showing your German immigrant ancestor on the way to America, that might also state the birthplace or last residence of that ancestor. A lot of researchers have serious trouble even finding their ancestor's passenger list record. Sometimes when a researcher has searched sufficiently hard for a passenger list record and come up empty, they'll just come up with a far-out hypothesis as to why their ancestor doesn't appear on any passenger lists they've looked at. A lot of people who can't find their ancestor on a ship passenger list assume their ancestor might have gone under a pseudonym or been a stowaway. Or a researcher might come up with an even weirder explanation. So, I think I've figured out why I can't find my great-great-grandpa on any ship passenger list to America. One word. UFOs. The only logical explanation is that a flying saucer abducted my great-great-grandpa from Germany in 1870, ran experiments on him, and then dropped him off in America. Hey, could you wrap that tinfoil a little tighter around my ears? When I was growing up, I had a legend on both my paternal and maternal sides of my family about a German ancestor who stowed away on a ship to America. They were both very similar. A German boy of about 17 years of age managed to get onto a ship without a ticket and then hid amongst the luggage until being found out, at which point he was put into some sort of service. On my father's side, the legend was that the ancestor had been put to work shoveling coal into the ship's furnace, and on my mother's side, the legend was that the ancestor had been put on potato peeling duty. I would later find out, in both instances, that neither legend was true. Archives in Germany would confirm that my German immigrant ancestors had paid all of their emigration fees, and that their parents had bought ship tickets for them, and they both appeared comfortably in the middle of the ship passenger lists, with no indication that they had been yanked out from underneath the suitcases and that their names had been scrawled onto the passenger list mid-journey. For some reason, much like the popular Indian princess ancestor myth that every American family seems to have, the German immigrant stowaway ancestor myth seems to be endemic to American families. Perhaps this myth adds to the family narrative of a desperate, impoverished ancestor who, against all odds, came to the land of opportunity and made something of themselves. Another theory that many historians have speculated is that it may be a case of lost in translation. German immigrants may have told their English-speaking children and grandchildren about their voyage and stated that they were in Zwischendeck on the ship journey, which literally translates to in-between deck, but more accurately means steerage. And perhaps the children sitting at grandpa or grandma's feet thought that this meant grandpa or grandma had been hiding between the passenger decks in the luggage deck. Every so often, there really truly is an immigrant ancestor who came to America as a stowaway. There are some ways to find out if your ancestor was truly a stowaway. The first thing to note is that many family history researchers falsely come to the conclusion that their ancestor was a stowaway because they can't find their ancestor on any ship passenger lists. This may be because they have only checked the Ellis Island website or Ancestry.com's collection of ship passenger lists and have neglected to check the National Archives Germans to America database or the German immigrants' websites for the 1850s through 1890s which often have records that the Ellis Island website or Ancestry.com don't have. It is also possible, though less likely, that a ship passenger list has simply been lost or destroyed and no longer exists anywhere, or that the passenger list exists but has not been indexed or digitized online yet. 
In all likelihood, your immigrant ancestor is listed on a ship passenger list that is probably available somewhere online, especially if your ancestor immigrated in the mid-1800s or later. Your ancestor's name was probably misspelled, spelled phonetically, anglicized, or has been wrongly transcribed by the indexer. Once you find your ancestor on a ship passenger list, you will be able to rather quickly tell if they truly were a stowaway or not. True stowaways were inevitably found before the end of the journey, because voyages across the Atlantic in the mid-1800s and earlier could take weeks or even months. And, let's face it, every human has to eat, drink, and, well, take care of other matters, eventually, and you would just have to come out from under that pile of suitcases eventually. Once a stowaway was found out by the ship's crew, they would have needed to be listed in the ship's records. They would be listed at the end of the passenger list, and would usually be explicitly marked with the word stowaway. If they were not explicitly marked as a stowaway, but their name is at the very end of the passenger list, perhaps written in different handwriting, or with different strokes, or with a different type of writing utensil, and perhaps with a bit of a gap between their name and the next-to-last names listed, this might indicate that their name was written on the list at a different time, or by a different hand which could corroborate the hypothesis that your ancestor was a stowaway who was discovered mid-journey. Typically, when a stowaway was found on a ship, they were indeed, like in the legends mentioned earlier, compelled to perform some kind of labor in order to pay for their transport. While I am sure an apprehended stowaway would have much rather been put to work as the ship's entertainer or official dessert tester, the reality is that shoveling coal into the ship's furnace or being put on spud-peeling duty would have indeed been likely sentences for the stowaway. Given that fact, stowaways would often be listed in the crew list for the ship, separate from the passenger list. If you find your ancestor listed in a ship crew list for just one voyage and never find them working on the crew of any other voyage of any other ship, it might not be that they tried their hand at a job that just wasn't a good fit for them. It might actually be that they were a stowaway. Be cautious and skeptical whenever you hear a family legend about a stowaway immigrant. Every family seems to have this legend, and it is almost always just that, a legend. If you would like to advertise on the German American Genealogist podcast, please click the Advertise With Us link in the podcast section on schmidtgen.com. Since we're such a young podcast, we have some really affordable prices if you would like an ad for your product or service to be featured in one of our episodes. Your advertisement will continue to pay dividends because these podcasts are archived and everyone who goes back to listen to an older episode will continue to hear your advertisement. Contact us today to get started. This Week in German History In early November in the year 911 AD, 1103 years ago, Duke Conrad I was crowned King of Germany. On November 5, 1494, 520 years ago, the German composer and playwright Hans Sachs was born in Nuremberg. Hans Sachs would go on to pen over 6,000 works and would create many of the folk songs and fairy tales that would come to define German culture. On November 5th, 1667, 347 years ago, the German painter 
Christoph Ludwig Agricola was born. Agricola is known for having painted some of the most enduring landscape pictures of England, Holland, France, and Germany. On November 8, 1895, 119 years ago, the German physicist Wilhelm Röntgen discovered X-rays by producing and detecting electromagnetic radiation in a wavelength range. On November 1, 1914, exactly 100 years ago, the German and British navies fought one of the battles of World War I not in the Upper Atlantic, but off the coast of Chile. German Vice Admiral von Spee decimated the British forces, but in the process used up half of his supply of ammunition, which would ultimately lead to his defeat in the Battle of the Falkland Islands one month later. In November of 1930, 84 years ago, the German polar researcher Alfred Wegener died during an expedition to Greenland. He also happened to have been born on November 1st, 50 years earlier, in the year 1880. Alfred Wegener was not only one of the pioneers of research into the Earth's polar ice caps, he was also one of the earliest proponents of what was at that time a strange idea called plate tectonics, positing that the crust of the Earth consisted of large chunks that were floating on magma and slowly moving over the millennia. It would be 20 more years before the rest of the scientific community would catch on and come to support Wegener's hypothesis of continental drift. On November 1st, 1939, 75 years ago, the first jet plane, the Heinkel He 178, was unveiled and demonstrated to the German Air Force. On November 1, 1946, the western German province of Niedersachsen, what we in English call Lower Saxony, was created within the national boundaries of Germany. This has been This Week in German History. You're listening to the German-American Genealogist Podcast. On today's episode, we're talking about strategies for finding your immigrant ancestor's birth town in Germany. So far, we've talked about how German immigrants, when they first got to America, typically lived in the household of a family member or someone they knew from back in the old country. If you can't find your immigrant ancestor's origin, you might want to try searching for their host family's origin, because your ancestor probably came from the same place. We've also talked about how ship passenger lists can reveal your immigrant ancestor's hometown in Germany. It can be difficult to find your ancestor in a passenger list, but rest assured they are in one. They probably weren't a stowaway, and even if they were, their name should still be on a ship's passenger list or crew list. Don't just rely on Ancestry.com's holdings of ship arrivals and departures. There are other websites that have different collections of passenger lists, like the NARA's Germans to America database, or FamilySearch.org, or websites like www.GermanImmigrants1850s.com www.germanimmigrants1860s.com, and so on. I'd like to spend a little more time talking about how to use the NARA's Germans to America database, because it's probably the best and most comprehensive database of passenger records for the years 1850 through 1897, but it does take a little know-how to navigate this database. It's not as easy to use as Ancestry.com's database. The NARA's Germans to America database can be found by googling the phrase NARA Germans to America database. The actual URL of the database website is way too long and clunky for me to read out loud, but you can also find a link to it on my blog at www.schmidtgen.com under the blog post title, German Genealogy Tip Number 20. 
In the NARA's Germans to America database, you can search for your immigrant ancestor by last name, first name, age, country of origin, destination, and manifest identification number. A manifest identification number is a unique number that identifies a particular voyage of a particular ship. For example, the January 20, 1892 voyage of the SS Virginia has a manifest identification number of 653, but other voyages of the SS Virginia will have other manifest identification numbers, and other voyages of other ships will also have their own unique manifest identification numbers. After you undertake a search for your immigrant ancestor in the NARA's Germans to America database and you are presented with a list of results, click the little paper icon to the left of the immigrant's name in the View Record column. This will display a page with more information on the immigrant, such as their name, age, sex, occupation, whether or not they're literate, country of origin, last residence, destination, travel accommodations, and the manifest identification number of that particular voyage. To then find out the name of the ship and the date of the voyage they were on, you're going to write down or copy the manifest identification number of that particular immigrant, and then go to the NARA's Manifest Header database webpage, which is a different database run by the NARA. To find this database, you can Google NARA Manifest Header Data, or you can go to the blog post on my blog that I mentioned earlier. I include a link to this database also. At the NARA's Manifest Header Data webpage, type in the manifest identification number you copied from the passenger file from earlier, and search for that number. You will then come up with a result that shows you the matching manifest identification number along with the corresponding ship name, port of departure, and date of arrival in the United States. Now you've successfully put together the immigrant information you gathered from the NARA's Germans to America database with the ship information you gathered from the NARA's manifest header database. While passenger lists of German immigrants arriving in America are relatively easy to come by, it can be a little more difficult to find a passenger list of the same German immigrant departing from Europe, but it can really pay off to find their passenger list from when they departed, especially if they departed from cities like Hamburg or Bremen. There is a good chance that their birthplace or town of origin is listed on the departing passenger list. When an emigrant left Germany, they would have created two records, a departure passenger list at the port in Germany where they left, and a separate arrival passenger list at the port in America where they arrived. American arrival passenger lists only rarely list the birth town of the immigrant. Many of the German departure lists have been lost or destroyed during the world wars. One of our listeners, Michael, writes in to inform us that, unfortunately, some of the Bremen records were destroyed by the Bremen government about a century ago. Not destroyed during a war or a revolution, but, he says, because the authorities didn't want to spend money for the storage of the records. Tragic but there are still many surviving departure passenger lists from Hamburg and Bremen. These departing passenger lists can be accessed on Ancestry.com. And if you come up empty looking for passenger lists, here's another idea. In the latter 1800s and early 1900s, a popular form of literature was the local county history and citizen biography book. Virtually every county in every state in America had several such history books written about it during this period. When researching German-American ancestors, especially ones who lived in rural areas, always check for local county history and citizen biography books published in the county where they settled. 
If your ancestor was featured in a biographical sketch, it may give a great deal of valuable information that might not be found anywhere else. FamilySearch.org has many such books freely available online in their collection, as do Google Books and the Internet Archive. I was recently researching an Irish ancestor for one of my clients, and coming up against brick walls everywhere I turned. Well, this particular ancestor happened to be from the area of Butler County, Iowa. So I went on FamilySearch.org and looked for county history books from Butler County, Iowa, and found one entitled A History of Butler and Bremer Counties and Biographies of Representative Citizens, published in 1883. Lo and behold, a whole biographical paragraph was published on this family, information that could not be found anywhere else. I want to read to you the biographical sketch that was published in this book so that you can get an idea of how these local county history books were written and just how much information you can find on an ancestor in a local county history book. As I read this, pay attention to how many vital points of genealogical information this contains. See if you can keep count. The biographical sketch reads as follows. One of the prominent early settlers of Albion Township was Daniel Downey, who settled here in 1856. Mr. Downey was born in County Cork, Ireland, in 1823, where he was educated in the art of farming. He came to the United States in 1847, lived in Vermont about two years, came to Illinois in 1848, and located in the town of Aurora, Kane County, where he learned the trade of a miller, at which he worked for about six years. He then settled on a farm in Kendall County in that state, where he resided until he came to Iowa. Mr. Downey bought his first land of Edward Dawson in Section 9 in Albion Township. He eventually became one of the most prominent farmers in the township, he increased his first purchase of land to 580 acres, which he still owns. His sons now conduct the farm. His wife, Mrs. Downey's maiden name, was Catherine Burns. She was born in County Wicklow, Ireland, about 1832, and came to the United States with her brother in 1848. Mr. and Mrs. Downey have seven children, James H., Hattie, wife of Charles Yonker, Daniel, Stephen, Kate, Mary, and Cora. They have lost two sons, John and Michael J. The latter, their oldest son, was a lawyer by profession and of fine attainments. He was located at Parkersburg for several years, and from there he removed to Dakota, where he died. December 18, 1882. The family are members of the Catholic Church. Mr. Downey with his family now live in Parkersburg. So, did you catch all of that? One single source gives us an individual's birthplace, birth year, information about his childhood, immigration year, all the places where he first resided in America and the years when he resided in those places, the date when he came to his present area of settlement, the various occupations that he practiced and the years that he practiced them, the name of the person he bought his property from, the location and the size of that property, the full maiden name of his wife, the birthplace and birth date of his wife, the immigration year of his wife, the fact that his wife immigrated with a brother of hers, the names of all of their children, including the already deceased ones, and even the occupation, location, and death date of one of their deceased children, as well as the family's church membership, and ultimately, their current place of residence. Wow! Not every individual is going to have a biographical sketch written about them in a local county history book. And even if they do, 
Not every individual's biographical sketch is going to be as detailed of a gold mine as this one was, but it always pays to look for biographical information on your ancestor in a local county history book, because typically these biographical sketches are like obituaries on steroids. Everything you ever wanted to know about your ancestor but were afraid to ask. Your loved ones aren't going to be around forever. Have you ever wanted to sit down and ask your dad about his experience in the war, or interview your grandma to get her life story, but haven't been sure how to conduct the interview and how to ask the right questions? That's why I wrote my new book, 2,000 Questions for Grandparents, Unlocking Your Family's Hidden History. 2,000 Questions for Grandparents contains a manual on how to conduct family history interviews, as well as 2,000 questions on such topics as childhood life, memories of previous generations, world events, outlook on life, marriage and family, career and hobbies, spirituality and politics, likes and dislikes, travels and migrations, military service, and more. Purchase 2,000 Questions for Grandparents today at a special early bird discount on lulu.com. You can find a link to the book in the publications section at my website, www.schmidtgen.com. Let's say that you suspect, for some reason or another, that your great-great-great-grandfather and your great-great-great-grandmother met and married in Germany, but that they were from different towns in Germany. In pre-20th century Germany, individuals usually married others who lived nearby, but every so often, a man and a wife from different towns were united in marriage. When this happened, the woman usually went to live with the man's family, and rarely the other way around. There are a few reasons for this. Reason number one, if a man had burger status, which means citizenship in a town, it was not transferable to other towns. If he moved to another town and he wanted burger status, he would have to go through all the arduous legal processes to get a new burger status in that town. Reason number two, a man was granted a right to practice a certain occupation, German towns regulated how many shoemakers, carpenters, barrel makers, etc. there could be. Trades like these were typically coveted, and it would have been difficult for a new resident to come to town and acquire the right to a well-paying occupation. Reason number three. Males typically inherited land from their parents, and it wouldn't have made sense for a man to give up the land that he had inherited in his hometown to move to another town. Reason number four. When a woman moved to a new town to marry a man, it was a much simpler legal process. They would usually just need to get the permission of the town's geicht, or town council. Reason number five. Men typically only moved to new towns during times of war, famine, or plague when matters became desperate and local authority structures weakened. When an area was destroyed by an invading army or decimated by the plague, there was little need to consult or worry about getting permissions from councils, mayors, or barons. During those times, people did what they could to survive. Wouldn't it be great if you could just open up the phone book and find your ancestors? Well, you kind of can, in a manner of speaking. Another great method for finding clues on where your German immigrant ancestor might have come from is to use the modern-day German phone book, which is available online at www.dastelefonbuch.de. That's D A S. T-E-L-E-F-O-N-B-U-C-H dot D-E. Here's how this strategy works. If the German surname is uncommon enough, 
you can look for where within Germany the surname seems to be concentrated today. Names like Schmidt or Müller or Meyer are going to be way too common to pinpoint with this method. But if you have German ancestors with rarer surnames like Bodega or Tasche or Rembach, this method can be effective. To use dastelefonbuch.de, input the surname that you are searching for in the Wer was input field. The German words Wer was mean who, what in English. And then hit the Finden button. Finden is the German word for find. You will be given a list of all the people in Germany with that surname, and you may see some concentrations of that surname in certain geographic areas. If you already have an idea where in Germany your ancestor was from, but you're not completely certain, you can also add a town name to the Wo input field. Wo is the German word for where. And by doing that, you can see if people with your ancestor's surname do still show up today in the town where you suspect your ancestor was from. Keep in mind that after the Industrial Revolution and the World Wars, many Germans moved away from the small villages where their ancestors had lived for hundreds of years and relocated to larger cities like Hamburg or Bremen or Essen. However, if you find a handful of Germans with your surname of interest living in a small village somewhere, it could be that these are the remnants of the family that remained in the original ancestral hometown. That hometown might be where your ancestor was from. If you are proficient in the German language, you can even use the telephone book records to write a letter to the German individuals with that surname to ask them what they know about their ancestry. You might find a long-lost cousin this way. If you can use the German telephone book records to pinpoint a town or an area in Germany where people with your desired surname seem to be concentrated, you can then pursue other avenues of research to try to find out if that is in fact where your German ancestor is from. You can contact a state archive or regional church district archive and ask them to conduct a search for your ancestor in that town, for a reasonable fee, of course. Lastly, every family history researcher has had bad experiences with indexes that misspelled our ancestor's name, or otherwise tripped us up. When it comes to genealogy, our motto ought to be, Seeing is believing. I knew it. What'd I tell you? This is how my great-great-grandpa got from Germany to America without appearing on a ship passenger list. Who's the crazy one now? If you'd like to see the real deal and use actual physical images of genealogical records from Germany, Many of them are available for completely free on FamilySearch.org. There are far more records on FamilySearch.org than the handful of transcribed or indexed records you get through the regular search function. In order to explore all that FamilySearch has to offer, you will need to dig in to the non-transcribed records in their collection. These are the records that won't show up in the results when you just do a regular search. To get to these hidden records, first go to the Family Search search page. To the right, you'll see a world map. Hover your cursor over Europe and Russia and click. A pop up box will appear. Inside the box, scroll down to the Germany option and click the Start Researching in Germany link that appears inside the box. On the Germany page, you can scroll down to view Germany Image Only Historical Records. There are hundreds of thousands of German records in this collection which you would never find through a text search. Explore around and see what Family Search has to offer for the area of Germany where your ancestor was from. You never know what you might find.
If you would like to advertise on the German American Genealogist podcast, please click the Advertise With Us link in the podcast section on schmidtgen.com. Since we're such a young podcast, we have some really affordable prices if you would like an ad for your product or service to be featured in one of our episodes. Your advertisement will continue to pay dividends because these podcasts are archived and everyone who goes back to listen to an older episode will continue to hear your advertisement. Contact us today to get started. Your loved ones aren't going to be around forever. Have you ever wanted to sit down and ask your dad about his experience in the war, or interview your grandma to get her life story, but haven't been sure how to conduct the interview and how to ask the right questions? That's why I wrote my new book, 2000 Questions for Grandparents, Unlocking Your Family's Hidden History. 2000 Questions for Grandparents contains a manual on how to conduct family history interviews, as well as 2000 questions on such topics as childhood life, memories of previous generations, world events, outlook on life, marriage and family, career and hobbies, spirituality and politics, likes and dislikes, travels and migrations, military service, and more. Purchase 2000 Questions for Grandparents today at a special early bird discount on lulu.com. You can find a link to the book in the publications section at my website www.schmidtgen.com. I really enjoy doing this podcast, but I also enjoy researching genealogy for other people. My professional genealogy research services are available for hire on an hourly commission basis. If you have a genealogical brick wall and you'd like to get some expert assistance, please contact me at my website, www.schmidtgen.com. Thank you for tuning in to this week's episode of the German American Genealogist Podcast. I'd love to hear your comments, suggestions, and questions, so please don't hesitate to email me through my website, www.schmidtgen.com. If you have ideas for future episodes or want further information on something I mentioned in a previous episode, please contact me. I read all of my emails and will try to respond as soon as I can. Take care, have a wunderbar week, and auf Wiedersehen.